of today, we're going to explore what is at the heart of every ecosystem. And I describe this as talent. Um, and a, a talent is needed um, when, when, when we are driving platform businesses to success that they have already achieved to date. So, uh, but when we look a little bit closer, there are subtle nuances in distribution, nature versus nurture, access to education, and how expectations and reality come to play. We are in extremely experienced hands in this field with Anami Reyes, who will be moderating this panel. Anami is the Managing Director and COO at Energy Innovation Hub and founder of Purple Beach, a people and innovation consultancy. Anami has also a wealth of experience in identifying, recruiting and nurturing platform talents um, and led HR functions globally at eBay, PayPal and Skype. Anami, I'm handing over to you and your fabulous panelists. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone, and a very, very welcome to this conversation. Um, and I'm much looking forward to be hearing today what Olivia Vina and Peter have to say to us. I will introduce Olivia and uh, Vina to you. And then, Peter, you're going to get us going by sharing a few reflections. And I'd ask you to introduce yourself as part of that. Um, sure part of the session. But let me start with um, a quick introduction to two, what I call them, and they don't like it. It's no reflection on age, guys, but um, to, I'd like to introduce you to two veterans of digital and platforms, and they're Olivia and Vina. Um, Olivia cut his teeth at the FT, then spent um, some time at eBay, um, working on a variety of scaling related topics. He spent uh, six years launching and growing Ancestry.com, then moved on to Telmix, which is a talent platform and is now GM and VP International at StockX, which um, is described when we had a conversation earlier today, Olivia, as a new breed of e-commerce platform with a specific focus on Gen Z. And I think, you know, if we weren't having this talent conversation, I, I would have loved to hear even more about that. Um, Vina, on to Vina. Vina has an amazing combination of lawyer, strategist and talent partner. Um, she had a phenomenal career at eBay where her roles included amongst others, um, leading IP globally for eBay Inc. And then she moved on to Russell Reynolds, where she advises on digital and product talent, change, trends. And um, as far as I'm concerned, she's really at the forefront of this digital and platform revolution. Peter, um, why don't I hand over to you for a few minutes? Um, so Peter will give us a few things to reflect on. Please type your questions in the chat. And um, after Peter has uh, said a few words, we'll start our conversation. Peter, over to you. Sure, thank you very much. It's a great opportunity. Thank you for the invitation to uh, join this really great uh, event today. Talk about all different dimensions of the platform landscape. So um, I actually have to, gives tribute to Annabelle Gower. She's helped influence my thinking about platforms. And Annabelle and I, a number of years ago, did the first global survey of platforms where we looked at platforms not only in uh, the United States, in Europe, but also Africa and in Asia. And that uh, really grounded my thinking about the diversity. There's so many different types of platforms in so many different parts of the world. It's a pretty exciting and interesting space. I currently am the managing partner of the Platform Strategy Institute and uh, work closely with Jeff Parker and Marshall Van Alstein um, on all sorts of different projects related to platforms. And one of the areas that I've gotten quite interested in is around platform talent and platform education. So um, last year we launched a global survey to better understand what companies are looking for with respect to platform talent. And uh, we compiled a database of job postings um, and we're able to collect 11,000 job postings. And so this is both from startups, um, ex, you know, established companies that are you know, already platforms and they're looking to either continue to grow or replace people who have left. And then you have, um, incumbent companies that are interested in launching platform initiatives. And so they need the talent as well. 
So Petra, I think we have some slides. I was gonna just jump through um, a few of those to set the context for our discussion. What I think is interesting is, is that we've reached a stage, you know, the, the, uh, the rise of platforms is, is, you know, they've been around since the 50s. You know, some people point to credit card companies, for example, and, you know, it depends even if you go back to markets, uh, marketplaces, some people attribute those as being platforms, but kind of the rise of digital platforms is really a phenomenon that's happened in the last 15 years or so. Um, and the, uh, the significance of platforms uh, in our economies uh, globally has really deepened. And so it's given rise to uh, the need for a managerial class that actually runs these platforms. And so I call these platform professionals. And so these are people who are hired to um, actually do the key functions of running either an entire platform business or a component of a company's business that is a platform. So if you go to the next slide, I just want to distinguish this from the uh, you know, important um, significant focus on the gig workers or the freelancers. So this is really not about that group, which are the contributors to the platform, but rather the platform managers that are being uh, hired and are key to uh, the actual operations of the platform. And this uh, I'm borrowing here from Mitzberg, who's extremely well known in the management literature for his work on managers. And I've adapted to his model slightly to add the freelancers and gig workers, which weren't part of his original model. But the area that I want to focus in on are the executives, the technical, the middle line and the operations. So if we go to the next slide. Yeah, so just in terms of context, and, and I'll just point out one, one, I think, important element of this is, you know, we know that a lot of platforms uh, find their start in the, the United States. And in fact, if you look at top 100 platforms and look at their market capitalization, this is new data as of January this year, uh, the top, you know, the, the companies that are from the United States in the top 100 now constitute $9.8 trillion in market capitalization. Asia also has very large platforms. And if you aggregate those, you get to uh, 4 trillion. The, the big you know, outlier here is Europe. And uh, if you take just European platform companies, they only aggregate to 430 billion uh, in market capitalization. So if you go to the next slide, this has significant implications for the employment uh, uh, picture because um, if you look at those 100 largest platforms in Asia, you'll find that they employ 2.3 million people. And in the US, it's 1.7. But then you look at Europe and you find only 180,000. So that means that the talent pool, and not all of these are obviously platform professional managers. This is the entire workforce. But it just goes to show that there's an imbalance in the, the labor pool right, that are associated with these platforms. And this is direct employment, not indirect employment. So if you encountered that indirect employment, it'd obviously be much uh, larger than that. But uh, this is to point out that, you know, European companies that are interested in growing their platform businesses just have a much smaller talent pool to draw from to hire. So I just wanted to flag that as an issue for Europe. Okay, next slide. So what are the key roles? Um, I'll go through this very quickly. You know, there's been a lot of focus in, you know, the discussions around platforms, around platform technology, tons of discussion these days around platform data and all of the interesting processes like the application of AI and what does that mean from the standpoint of platforms. So what I'm trying to do in this research is to elevate the important role of people, right? These platforms don't operate on their own. You need talented people to run them so what are some of the key roles? As I mentioned, we did a survey of uh, 11,000 job posting. And from that analysis, six key roles dropped out. Uh, you see postings for uh, platform strategists. Um, and so that's an interesting role. You see a lot of posts for platform product managers. So these are the people responsible for all the issues that are associated with running a platform product. And we have to realize that some companies run multiple platforms. So 
it's not just one company, one platform. You have some companies that have multiple platforms that they operate, and so they need multiple platform product managers as a consequence. Then you have a unique role, I think, for um, that you know are associated with platforms is this idea of an ecosystem manager. They come with all sorts of different titles. Sometimes they're called uh, community organizers or head of community. Um, but these are the folks that are responsible for the external ecosystem and creating value uh, associated with that and growing those communities and setting the engagement strategy, et cetera. So super interesting roles. And we see a lot of po job postings around that. Then you have platform engineers. You know, These are complicated uh, technology stacks to run and operate. And so um, there's typically have engineering teams. And so there's a, quite a number of jobs associated with platform engineering. And then there's a new role that's emerging around platform data management. This isn't just the data scientists. This is the overall process of understanding how your data is collected, how it's managed internally, how it's uh, shared potentially with third parties. And you get into deep discussions around APIs and things of that nature. But there's a lot of jobs actually being posted for platform data managers. And then finally, as our previous panel uh, focused on, which is this uh, regulatory landscape is changing and becoming more complex. And so you do see uh, numbers of roles being posted around platform privacy and compliance and all those issues associated with management. You also see um, interesting roles around protection of the platform. As these platforms get very large, um, these companies obviously want to protect those platforms. And so you get um, roles for around platform trust and platform defense. Um, which is an interesting title that Airbnb just posted recently. Okay, next slide. So um, this is just a very small uh, example of the global scope of the jobs that are available. And I, uh, I put in the, the chat box a link to, um, we try to keep updated on some of the interesting job posts that are out there. Uh, right now, we're, we have a list of uh, community jobs that are uh, active, but uh, just, you know, this is just to show that this isn't just a US and Europe and you know, Asia, there's platforms all over, right? And uh, really interesting jobs that I think um, are exciting for, you know, new people or people who are interested in, in changing and growing their careers is uh, thinking of themselves as platform professionals and the type of opportunities that exist in this space. Okay, next, I think this is my last slide here. Yeah, so I wanted to do um, an estimate, you know, how many of these jobs are available? And this is super rough, but I think it gives, a, a, you know, a kind of an estimate of the magnitude of the jobs. As I mentioned, if you take the top 100 companies, there are about 4.2 million people directly employed by those top 100 platforms. Now that's a lot of people, right? Um, and if we estimate, and you know, I've looked around to see what percentage are managers and most of the literature says that about 10% of the companies are in the managerial class. So that gives you uh, 420,000. If we take just a third of those, which would be you know, strategically important for understanding how to run the platform as a platform versus more functional roles where it doesn't really they don't have to have that necessarily that platform expertise. You get down to 138,000. Um, and then if we look at the churn rate, so how many of those people are out there, you know, they need to be replaced and we take a churn rate of 10%, that's 13,000 of the 100 companies. So that's the top 100 companies and estimate is they're looking for about 14,000 people a year in key platform professional roles to run their operations. And if then we scale that broadly to uh, startups and incumbents that are building platforms, um, here's this ballpark estimate of 40,000 job openings a year. So that's pretty significant. Um, and as I pointed out earlier, for Europe, I think a challenge, and I'd be interested in the panelists' perspective on this, is just the, the number of people with experience running platforms in Europe is just less. And so as a consequence, it's, that's another area where it becomes even more difficult to quickly establish and scale a platform in Europe. It's just that the talent doesn't exist. So um, anyway, I'd be interested in people's perspective on that. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll uh, let others uh, take over and join the conversation. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Peter. Um, and I'm actually going to start with a, uh, a reflection and actually want to hear what Bina and Olivia have to, to say about it as well. Um, in my experience, I, I think of the times that we work within Europe at some of these platform businesses that, that, that we all know about, and they were generally um, staffed by very international teams. Um, so whilst potentially there might be, a, an, a, do you think there is a scarcity of talent in Europe? Probably yes. But what is the reality of actually who makes up these talent teams? Um, so maybe if I start with Vina and then Olivia, right? Yeah, of course, thanks, thanks Anne-Marie. And that's a, that's a really, really good point. So in Europe, you know, if you look at one of the examples that you gave Peter, so, so product leaders, for example, it is a narrower pool. Um, in Europe, for sure, I think about 75% of product executives sit in the US. Um, but, you know, we work very globally, but I would say that if you look at that, if you look at that talent, the quality is extremely high for various reasons, because you've either had to fight to get ownership within a US headquartered organization, or you are managing multiple countries, multiple cult cultures, um, uh, multiple payment systems, you know, to, to give an example. So, uh, so in that sense, the sophistication at which you have to come, with which you have to come at it, often with lower resources as well, um, is, is incredibly high. So I think, yes, there is, there is um, a narrower pool here, but I think the quality is higher. And I would agree with Anami's point that the teams are, are very international and as they are kind of diverse both in terms of um, background uh, and I mean background of career but also background of you know the birthplace I guess um, and, and, and education um, I think they are in, in in many ways and they need to be able to better able to see around corners is what I would say and I think in Europe organizations have to take ownership of being almost schools to develop this talent and it's great to see all that you know i'm learning all of this about the education options that there are there but you know i think the, the, it's it's up to in the way that ebay google yahoo you know did in the past i think even the smaller organizations coming up have to take that ownership for developing the talent thank you um olivia no i think i think that's spot on the um the talent pool in europe has to become scrappy over time it's had to you know sort of make space and, and, and make the case for the, the, the projects or the, uh, the initiatives that it wants to drive. And I think that creates a lot of, uh, a lot of stamina, a lot of, uh, a lot of energy. I also think that, you know, and yes, I, I wince and being called a veteran, but there, are, there have been pretty large platform businesses established in Europe now for a while. And I'm always struck by the depth of the, sort of the alumni networks that have kind of graduated from those platform networks who've gone on to do sort of really interesting things. So I think the talent pool is actually pretty good these days. It's probably not anywhere near like sort of Bay Area type of depth, if you like, but um, I wouldn't sort of beat us up too much about the, uh, the talent pool available. Um, there is, you know, definitely a, a new generation as well as a sort of a more, more sort of a vintage uh, cohorts of, uh, of platform experienced leaders out there. And I think that type of speech, I'm going to come to you as well in a second, right? So I think the, I think the, what I love is Marina saying that, that maybe the, the challenge is let's build more, some of the, uh, more of those top platform businesses in Europe. Um, but then switching gears for a second um, to what do we actually define as platform talent? Um, and I'm, I'm curious because there's a direct question for you, Peter, but then we'll, I, I'm also interested, Olivia and Vina, on your reflection. So there was a question for you that says, can I assume the job title does not typically contain platform or ecosystem? Um, and in consequence, you know, how does one measure this? So that is a direct question to you, Peter. And then Olivia and Vina, my question to you guys is, um, how do you define platform talent then, right? If it is, it feels a little bit more vague. Um, so Peter. Sure, so um, the this research project was sort of a probing exercise. There's really has not been any look, you know, systematic look at platform talent. And so you have to start somewhere and, uh, we wanted to see what how many companies were out there looking for this platform talent. We're actually surprised at um, how many uh, companies do use the word platform. Uh, that was the 
you know, the keyword that we used uh, in the search. However, there's tremendous variation in the quality of the job descriptions. And um, the other thing that I think is interesting is um, some of the things they point to, I think maybe not qualities that we would consider essential to actually being successful in running a platform. So I think there's actually a tremendous opportunity and I would love to uh, powwow with Annabelle and other uh, scholars to think about this, this question of, is, can you define uh, a leader in a platform to be separate from a leader in a, what they sometimes call as a pipe company? Are the attributes of that leadership different? And I think, and based on some preliminary conversations, there are some key characteristics. Um, one is this ability to orchestrate and facilitate and create value outside the boundaries of the firm. And so I think that's a key attribute. Another is, is just understanding the economics of a platform, you know, un really deeply understanding network effects. What, what does that mean in all of its manifestations for pricing, for product design, for data collection, all of those types of things. And I think the numbers of people out there that really have a good foundation in that area is, is pretty small. And so I think there's just tremendous opportunity. And I think, you know, as we've already, I've heard the panelists mention that uh, a lot of this is being put on the companies. So that actually gives an advantage to the incumbents because they already have this knowledge. Um, and so they can share that quickly. And so, I don't know, I, my view is the European Commission should spend a little bit more time focused on how to create the talent pools to drive the next generation of, of growth of platforms rather than this obsessive focus just on the regulation side. It's just, I think a more balanced uh, policy discussion around that would be very uh, healthy and good for Europe overall. Yeah, and I think I think that definitely could be the subject of a whole nother <laughs> A whole nother event. Um, but Olivia and Vina, what are your perspectives? I think Peter made some really valid points there, especially around the leadership topic, right? Platform versus not. But but let, let's let's talk about the, how do you define platform talent? And maybe even if you could comment on platform leadership, because I think those two comments were really spot on. Olivia, uh, Vina, do you want to go? Olivia, should I go first? Yep. Um, so it, it's, so platform talent is, is really interesting, you know, as a term. I mean, let, let's step back a minute. You know, it's, it's cross-function, it's cross-sector, it's, you know, cross-scale, it's cross-ambition. It can be growth, it can be transformation. Um, this is not a talent pool that really sits easily into one bucket. It's pervasive. And as a colleague, and a word a, a colleague you used er, uh, earlier today, it's becoming increasingly omni-relevant, which I, I just love that word. Um, and I think that that's the reality. And I think when you look at platform talent, it's really hard and rightly so to put them in a box. It very much depends on where the company is, where it's looking to go next, what is the bed strength, what is missing. And you know, as I said before, what do they need to help them see around corners? Um, but there are, you know, if I had to look at three specific attributes that I don't think are unique to this talent, but I think become increasingly important to this kind of talent, um, it is the, the, the customer empathy piece. You know, it's, it's, it's critical in all leaders as, it, you know, you should really all leaders should be wearing the customer on their shoulder. But I think in platform businesses, it becomes increasingly important. Um, the second one is, I think this, and it's connected to it, but it's really this um, connected to the EQ point, but it's this ability to manage tensions because you're talking about multiple stakeholders when you're building a platform around a community or for a community any decision that you make that may better the experience of one person is going to in in many cases negatively impact the experience of someone else so let's take the obvious example of a marketplace as there's a few of us who've had experience at ebay something that you do to better protect buyers is going to put additional strain on sellers so someone who has that ability to really manage the trade-offs and manage the tensions and think things through holistically is going to have a huge advantage in this in this organization and I think the third quality that you know it's very important to test for in these leaders is curiosity um, you can't be dogmatic even about how you view 
a customer. And I think that's something you said, Peter, and I completely agree. You have to be able to have a lens to the outside world. What is the world doing as well as internally speaking, speaking to your spe stakeholders, speaking to um, those representing and speaking to your customers and actually taking the time to speak to customers and really understand you can't come with a standard view because platforms by their nature are evolved by the community and you need to be there listening to that pulse in order to be successful. Thanks, Vina. Olivia? I think it's I think it's spot on. I'm thinking of platform talent as what I call a digital plus. You have to have all the core ingredients of a, of a digital skill set. You have to have this focus on the user experience that, that Vina mentioned, that sort of empathy. You have to have that. You have to have a test and learn mindset, being very analytical, think about acquisition, retention, all the good things that happen in, in a digital model. But on top of that, you have to, and I love the, the, the idea of sort of empathy and, and of managing tension because you're creating an enabler for others to engage and transact. So you're really having that ecosystem you end up having responsibility for. So it's a really fascinating sort of high degree um, sort of thought process around managing obviously the, the demand and the supply, but the matchmaking in the middle in all its guises, the, the product and experience aspects of it, the trust and safety and community aspects of it, the economics aspects of it. So the matchmaking is really that, at the heart of it. And so for me, that ecosystem is really, I'm observing around the teams I've dealt with, it's not uncommon that folks have actually a background in economics who go into it. And I think there's an interesting conversation to be had around, is, is economics as a, as a science sufficiently engaging with platforms as a business model um, because a lot of what's happening in the economics world, I happen to have a degree in economics from many moons ago, um, is, uh, is that there's a lot of relevance there. And the other um, component I will add, we mentioned network effects. When a platform takes off, it takes off like a rocket. So as well as all the things we've talked about, this sort of ability to handle hyperscale is also a, a really important aspect of a successful, particularly sort of platform leader, I'd say, what happens when things take off? Because when they take off by nature, by definition, you're going to have this sort of exponential growth curve. Great. And so I'm also keeping an eye on the chat. And I think there, there are two points that relate to this, right? So there is the need to have more talent, the need to educate the talent. But then also one of the questions I think, Renzo, you hinted at it, which was this real... Um, you know, sometimes the, the HR or talent partners in an organization, because there isn't a wealth of them who've come through the platform um, journey, can't spot what good looks like, or the recruitment processes are quite different to what they need to be to really attract the right type of talent, um, you know, that could work in um, platforms. We had another comment, which is quite often, though, um, entry into platform organizations are difficult because experience is required in particular in Europe I would say that's the case because you know the pool is so small and we need to really get businesses up and running quickly but what are some of your reflections on that Peter again Peter Vina Olivia on how we need to evolve potentially the talent acquisition pr process because I think I've seen so many bad hires in this context. And whilst we might have a hundred and how many did you say? 180,000 and the pool is very small. doesn't mean all 180,000 people are great just because they have somehow worked in a, in, in the space. So maybe Peter, do you want to have a go at that question? Sure. What, what's interesting is um, some companies have this idea that they just need to hire one person True. to drive their platform initiatives. Um, and then everything is right, you know, if they find that one person. But I, one of the things that, that came out in the survey that we did is that um, there are some companies that are doing what you might call programmatic platform hiring, is that um, they're hiring up to 60 people, maybe 70 people a year. Um, and you can imagine just in, for example, open banking in the financial services space, if you're a large bank and you hire one or two platform people, if you think you're going to have an impact with that, it's, you know, it's that person is not going to be successful. So, so some companies like Revinitive, um, which was bought by the London Stock Exchange recently, if you look at their hiring patterns over the last four years, 
they're hiring many, many, many people in the platform space. And they announce that they're looking for platform people and they're putting them in all over the world, not just in Europe. Um, there are hires in the US, hires in Latin America, hires in Singapore. So it's actually a global programmatic program. So I think the larger companies uh, that are launching platform initiatives can't rely on just one or two hires. They really need to do this as a systematic process. The other thing that I think is interesting is that I have not seen too many you know, um, executive recruiting firms. They, they have digital practices, but I'm a little bit surprised that they have an established um, dedicated platform uh, kind of uh, offerings because there's so many companies out there now looking for platform talent that it strikes me as a is a missed opportunity not to show that you have a dedicated focus in this area and you're building dedicated competency and can serve clients that are looking for that competency. And maybe I'm missing it, but uh, I'm super interested to watch on the uh, recruitment side, how they're evolving to serve the market. Vina, I'm, thanks, Peter. Vina, I'm quite interested on your perspective in that regard. Yeah, of course. So I think platform, I'd agree with what, um, you know, what was said earlier, it's kind of digital plus um, with some additional pieces involved in it. So as with um, the way that we are moving our technology practice, I would very much see platform talent as a horizontal um, because it is sits across multiple sectors. You can't really have it as, as, a, as a vertical. Um, and I think having it as a horizontal helps you <laughs> almost in a, in a platformy way, um, helps you really um, uh, connect candidates with organizations and help that cross pollination because you don't, you know, organizations are very aware and increasingly so uh, in my experience, they don't want someone who brings exactly the same thing. They're really looking to cross pollinate. And if you think of it as a horizontal, it works better. Um, and I think if, if recruiters don't have platform as, as a name for that um, particular horizontal, it's because I think platform is so complex in itself. There are multiple functions. So, you know, it's not like retail or industrial um, because it's not, it's not a sector. Um, and you can't even say it's the engineering practice because it's so much broader than that. Um, but it is, it kind of threads its way through um, a lot of it. And I think what organizations even want when they're looking at talent um, can just be so incredibly, incredibly different that we wouldn't want to lose the nuance by lumping everyone together um, in, into, into, this, into this one bucket. I kind of, I think it loses some of the benefit of what you get. Um, but I think it's, you know, it's a really, it's a really interesting point. Um, Mike, I think, Vina, you're picking up on something interesting there, right? Because the the one thing that I'm, in my experience, have also found, and it's again a nuanced point, mm -hmm. is that the cultures in all these different platform businesses are so different. And so not only do you have to match skill set and experience, but more often than not, you have to find that that excitement, that real passion, that that matchmaking, and sometimes. Certainly, I've seen that 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 really also is an added nuance or, or layer of complexity that that comes into the mix. No, absolutely. So <laughs> I'm, I'm just looking at the time. I think we only have like three minutes, and there've been so many comments and questions around education. You know, where can we learn and grow ourselves? You know, what role should progressive um, platform companies themselves, employers, maybe play in this context? So. What are your perspectives? In closing, how would you suggest each of you that we grow um, platform capabilities? Who should do it? Whose responsibility is it? And you know, maybe even advice for where you can start um, if, as a business, you want to grow those capabilities, or if if you, as an individual, want to grow yourself. I'm just having a look if there's anything we want to. Yeah, I think that's it. So Olivia, who had a shout out as a veteran, again, in the chat, <laughs> in message from Eindhoven. Let's so, not mention the V about? word again. So I, I think anybody could be successful, ultimately, in, in a platform business. There are a three key ingredients that I think have sort of bubbled up during this conversation. There needs to be intellectual curiosity and agility, for sure, because we're generally talking about solving complex problems, multivariate problems. Ability to handle ambiguity, in my mind, I mean, that's a sort of 
goes almost like without saying in any digital environment, it's particularly the case. And the third one is manage, uh, combining, combining this analytical and empathetic sort of skill set. I think sort of Ina called out really well. My advice to sort of to platforms, big or, or small, frankly, in terms of uh, talent is grow your own. You know, I think the most important thing is there's not going to be a ready factory of, of sort of you know, plug and play platform leaders, but find the high potential you know, uh, future leaders who show some of those skills in, in spades, spot them, coach them, stretch them, because that is ultimately the best possible way to sort of, you know, to scale the organization. Now, none of what I'm saying is, isn't true in any other industries and, 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 and businesses anyway, but I think in, given the sort of fit, the, the, the pace of change and the complexities, it's particularly important for, for platforms. Thanks, Olivia. I'm going to add something on to the last two of you to comment on. So you got off lightly, Olivia. Um, I, I saw a really interesting comment in, the, in the, one of the questions as well, where um, it was asked, how much of the platform success is a function of platform talent? So I guess, can you weave that into your closing remarks as well, Peter? Um, I think it's absolutely critical, right? You have to know how to assemble the technology. You have to know how to design your market strategy. And, you know, I would just leave with saying that this notion of being a platform professional is a super exciting career opportunity. And um, there are a numbers of executive education courses of all ranges of prices, all the way up from you know, more than $5,000 for a weekend to just $750 for a three week course. So what I'm seeing out there is, is that um, young people and mid careers are actually assembling their own portfolio to demonstrate to the market that they have these capabilities. I'm just still stunned that no university has put together a minor or a major in platform management and strategy. I think it's a huge opportunity and I think the universities are missing the boat. Um, and so now is the time to strike and uh, Europe is a great place to, to launch that kind of initiative. Um, there are courses available. I'm not saying that there aren't. It's just that if you're a young person and you're trying to demonstrate to potential hires that you've gone through the rigor of taking a program, and, and also for the school, uh, the, the businesses to go and find where the pipeline talent is, you know, um, it would be very useful for the universities to jump on board and to go beyond this uh, broad digital capability, because this is a digital plus. And in fact, I think these are the most exciting roles in the company because it's putting you at the forefront of the firm's strategy. And mm -hmm. so I would just leave with saying that it's, it's a super exciting career opportunity and uh, universities and the executive recruiting world need to focus on this and, you know, uh, provide services that, that meet the opportunity. Thanks, Peter. Vina. So um, I think four things really, um, and, I'll, and I'll weave in, weave in your kind of extra question as well, Hanami. Um, so the first one I'd say is, you know, focus on competencies and mindset just as much as you focus on experience with these leaders, that is critically important. Um, secondly, think of the bank strength. You know, if you're talking about leadership team or whatever your team, team you're talking about, trying to think really carefully about filling the gaps. Don't hire what's worked in the past. I mean, you want to be evolving, you want to be moving forward. So fill the gaps, hire to fill gaps and add, um, not replicate. Um, and thirdly, Olivia mentioned it, but it's such a good point that I think it's worth mentioning again, be your own school develop your people, be a school, um, you know, give them the education as they are working for you. Um, and I think finally, you know, on your point, Anami, people are going to break, make or break platform businesses. It is the number one asset in any organization because you're servicing communities, you're not building widgets. It's, it's more important than it is anywhere else. Um, and also, and I think in that context, diversity becomes more important than ever. You know, make sure you're hiring to represent the com communities you're serving. Great, and on that note, I wish we could have carried on for quite a lot longer, um, but we can't, unfortunately. So just it remains with me to say thank you very much, Vina, Peter and Olivia. And um, yeah, let's, let's see where this goes and let's see if anybody heard, Peter. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It was a great panel. Really enjoyed it. Right. Thank you. Um, Petra, I think I'm, am I handing back to you?
You are. Um, thank you, Anami, Vina, Olivia, and Peter. It was really fascinating. And I'm not just saying this, I, I was sitting <laughs> crouching to my chair. And especially also a big thank you for picking up so many questions from the audience and very elegantly. I think you've got a very happy uh, listener audience there. Um, it's clear that talent really, really underpins the success of so many organizations in the ecosystem. And um, I'm absolutely certain that this is not the first or the last time that we've discussed this topic. I'm looking forward to successive rounds of um, many more interesting exchanges here. Mm -hmm.